Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Electric Uncut, a video series here on the channel where I discuss larger concepts or ideas that don't necessarily belong to one piece of media, of film, or a video game, but it's something that I see as a general trend across the channel that comes up a lot in the comments section, but it's an idea that can't quite be explained in a specific review. And so today's concept is something that I think has been on the tip of everyone's tongue for a very long time, at least people who view my channel, but doesn't necessarily have a concept to describe it concretely. And so that is the idea with today's video. And the concept I'd like to address is what I like to call artistic laundering. And so what artistic laundering is in a nutshell is taking an established piece of media, whether it's a video game, a film, a franchise, an IP, and then injecting into it elements that do not match up and do not follow the original artistic vision of that piece of media. And instead, that piece of media is being used as a source of laundering for these new elements that don't actually stand up on their own. Kind of like money laundering in real life where you have a bunch of criminal money that you can't really report to the IRS or anything like that. You're gonna get your ass in jail. And then you take legitimate sources of money and in order to make that work, you sort of blend them together and you get this sort of half rinsed money. And the problem that we're seeing is that this is something that has happened a lot with art over the years. This is something that isn't necessarily new, but we're seeing it at a rate now where it's becoming a real issue. And so what we're seeing right now isn't a lack of content. It isn't a lack of new media being produced. It's that all the media that is being produced is regurgitated and spat into our mouths and it's just not fulfilling even though you can eat it all day every day you just won't ever be fulfilled i think there is some sort of concept like this in real life with really poorly nutritional food where people can literally eat it and eat it and eat it in third world it doesn't have the nutrition that they need so that's kind of a good way to think about it in the abstract but i also want to talk about specifically what this looks like in both video games and film. This also occurs in music, but we'll leave music out of this video. So let's begin with talking about what it looks like in video games. And there's actually quite a few ways it manifests itself that I find pretty frustrating. So the first one that is actually kind of established on this channel, but I think needs to be reiterated so people understand is bad ports. And this is something that I talk about a lot on the channel. I've written articles about this. I've had many videos ex describing this issue, but I think this can also be traced back to artistic laundering, a simple bad port where you take a bunch of psycho games, you put them on a cartridge, you put them on a disc or whatever it is. They're not well done. They're not respectful of the original hardware, the original vision of the games. And so you're getting these watered down poor quality versions, that is one form of artistic laundering. And the way that I've addressed that on this channel is I'm always separating out the elements of the port of the elements of the original game. I'm trying to tell you that there is a difference between the original good meat of Strikers 1945-2 and the garbage cancerous filler of input lag and all the other issues that have been injected upon it by zero div or city connection. I'm trying to pull that apart for you. And I honestly think this is one of the main jobs of a critic or a reviewer, whether it's video games or film, something that I will be trying to do is trying to pull apart these elements, take out the garbage and say, this is the problem. And it highlight these are the strong core foundation. So bad ports is one of the cleanest, easiest examples of this because it's like a technical issue. We all can see it. We all can understand it. But you'll be surprised. I would say before I started doing a lot of my shmup reviews, this whole concept of pulling apart the original game from the additions of the port wasn't really done across a lot of stuff. Like if you go ahead and read a bunch of old shmup reviews, even of Switch ports, like on Nintendo Life or whatever, those reviewers we're not pulling these two ideas apart from one another. They were just saying Strikers 1945-2 is an excellent game. We all recognize that. Therefore, the port on the Nintendo Switch is also excellent. 
without trying to parse through these individual elements. So that's the very straightforward, simple version of artistic laundering that you'll see most across shmups. And then another example of artistic laundering that comes up quite a bit in my videos and reviews, but is a lot more subtle, is what I like to call the sequelization of mistakes and sequelization of bad design and how you're able to launder poor design and video games into sequels and then cover that mistake up through sequelization. So an example of this is when I reviewed Soul Cresta and I pointed out some issues in Soul Cresta. I had a comment that said, well, obviously, Mark, you didn't do your homework because these issues are also present in the games that precede Soul Cresta, that it's being a sequel of or being part of that series. So these are mistakes that are common in the series. This also came up in my review of R-Type Final 2, where I made complaints about bad design in R-Type Final 2, and I talked specifically what these elements were, the boss design, the patterns, the backgrounds, all that sort of stuff. I talk about all these individual elements that are problems with the design, and some of the feedback that people kind of pushed that away and said, well, these problems were in R-Type Final 1. So this is actually good design because they're basically recreating these mistakes in R-Type Final 2. So by having a sequel, what was once bad design can now be sort of justified by being in a series, which I reject that concept. But you'll be surprised how much this comes up over and over and over where Mega Man 2, maybe there's a bad sort of bit of level design in Mega Man 2. And when Mega Man 2 comes out, people complain and say, this is a problem. Mega Man 3 comes out, that same bad design is still there. That issue is still there. You review it and they say, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's part of the design because that's in Mega Man 2. And so this is an issue we see across reviews that is very frustrating for me personally, because basically in a lot of people's mind as long as you get away with it once it's like enshrined into law like it's double jeopardy or something you can't critique Mega Man 2 3 4 and 5 for the same mistake each and every time you have to just accept <laughs> I guess the mistake and so this is another form of artistic laundering that I find very frustrating and you'll see this across a lot of stuff right now because everything's a sequel everything's a franchise and so what was once an issue of game design is now just part of the IP or something. And it's actually a huge issue because what ends up happening then is you get what we have now in reviews where no one criticizes anything ever because it could always be justified that way. And then another issue of artistic laundering that appears in mainstream gaming is trend following game mechanics where a game mechanic is particularly popular and what will end up happening is that game mechanic will end up being laundered into everything. So everything that comes out now features this game mechanic as a selling point or something critics are going to appreciate. So they're cutting together elements of mechanics that work in one context, but do not work in the other. And the perfect example of this is the stamina meter in Sifu. And I talked a lot about this in my Sifu review. And you'll notice Sifu is like the perfect game to look at when it comes to artistic laundering, where all of these ideas are established and approved by critics in different games. You take them all, you mix them together, and then bam, you have a 9 out of 10, right? Well, the issue that I talked about in my review with that game is that these elements do not blend together harmoniously. They actually oppose one another. So Sifu says, let's do beat em up level design, arcade style design. That's a good idea in my opinion. But then let's mix in Dark Souls RPG combat and we just put them together. The big one is the stamina bars. So the reason stamina bars exist in Dark Souls and these action RPGs is to be an approximation of turn-based combat in an action game. They found that we want to have some sort of way to do turn-based combat or something like turn-based combat, but isn't going to be as restrictive as straight up timers and that type of thing that you get in traditional RPGs. So let's do a stamina bar that's like a in-between for a full-on action game like Ninja Gaiden or Devil May Cry. 
and a turn-based combat system. So that's the stamina bar. But when you stick a stamina bar into a full-on action game, it has no real purpose. It has no real meaning. They should have dropped the stamina bar in Sifu. But it's there. So that's another example, I'd say, of laundering in mechanic that don't fit with the vision, but they're popular and they're accepted and people are comfortable with them. And then the next example of artistic laundering, and I'm hoping you're seeing the underlying philosophy here now, is genre changing reboots, where you have an established IP that is successful and that it works. Final Fantasy, Fire Emblem, Super Mario. And then you change its genre, you reboot it into a new genre, and you're using the characters and the themes, but it's actually a totally different game. And the thing about this is that when you're doing some laundering, a time or two isn't that much of an issue. That's not a huge problem. So making Mario and then making Super Mario Kart, is that really an issue? No, I think you can get away with it. It's like with a VHS tape where you take a VHS tape and then you copy it. That copy of the VHS tape is pretty close to the original. It, it's going to work. It's going to be OK. The issue comes is when you make a copy of the copy and then you make a copy of the copy then you keep copying it and it gets blurrier and muddier and fuzzier and uglier. And that's what we're seeing right now. And then what ends up happening is all the other IPs that would be unique are failing away. Then what you end up happening is Mario as an IP, you know, is it really that special? Is it really that important? It's lower and lower quality stuff. Mario Party, Mario Party 9, 10, 11, or whatever it is. And then on top of that, you have the original vision of these genre switches are being pushed away, like F-Zero. So now we have Mario Kart. Do we need F-Zero? No, not really. You get this real over-representation of this one style that's just everywhere all the time. Happy-go-lucky, Mushroom Kingdom, smiling, sunshine, everything's good, Disney in Japan, Mario. And then all the alternative visions that Nintendo used to have of F-Zero, Metroid, Star Fox, that's all falling by the wayside because you're just snowballing everything over the top of it with the Mario IP. And you'll see this across a lot of different games, across a lot of different companies now. Square Enix with Final Fantasy. Everything's Final Fantasy now. Team Ninja just did a Final Fantasy character action game. I mean, that's cool, but at the same time, you know, Square Enix is just Final Fantasy now, basically, right? God of War. God of War was once a character action game. Now God of War is like this Western Dark Souls story of adventure game, right? And now we're just seeing a bunch of these story adventure games with IPs. And the problem with that is, does the IP of God of War really fit the idea of the new rebooted genre? Do those go together necessarily that well? Probably not. And this is something that we're running into again and again with mainstream gaming where they don't want to let go of these IPs. They don't want to let go of these brands and do something new, but they can't really fully break free of it either. So they're getting this weird hole in two directions where we want it to be an adventure game, but it also needs to be God of War at the same time. So we got to try and compromise this and water it down. And that's what we're seeing over and over again. And finally, for video games, another one that I have that might be a bit more controversial, in my opinion, is fan games. I'm actually not a huge supporter of fan games. I don't particularly like them. And the reason why I don't like them is not because I'm all about the copyright infringement or anything like that. It's because you're sort of feeding into this problem from the bottom up. So the top down, of this problem is Nintendo making 5 billion Mario games and all these different versions. Now there's a tactical XCOM Mario game. Now there's this and that, right? Everything's a Mario game. And from the bottom up, you say, well, I'm going to make this new idea that's original and interesting, and it's going to be a Mario game too. AM2R is a perfect example of this. AM2R should have been a legally distinct game with a new IP, with a new franchise that people can get into and support. But now it's in copyright purgatory and is it doing anyone any good? And it's like this weird thing now where Metroid fans look at all these kind of watered down lame Metroid games that are coming out and they say, man, but there was AM2R. Why didn't they just do AM2R? 
But the real question is, instead of staying in the safe little playground of being a fan, why didn't that developer take a bold step outward with his own original IP, original idea, and say this is a competitor to Metroid? And this is what we got in the past. And I think it was a much healthier environment. And this is why in the past we have so many more fantastic IPs. Because in the past, SNK didn't say, well, let's make a Street Fighter crossover game. That's what they would do now. Now, instead of making King of Fighters or Art of Fighting, SNK would just strike a deal with Capcom and make a Street Fighter cross whatever SNK game or whatever it is. But in the past, they would compete. They would make new IPs that, yes, have ideas and elements from other games, but they were their own distinct entity. And I think fan games are a real sort of symptom of that, where instead of people taking a step outward and making something original that borrows and takes influence, instead we're just feeding back into this. So that's artistic laundering in video gaming, and there's probably a lot more examples of that. But I also wanted to talk about it in film a little bit, because in film it's actually very interesting and something that I'll probably comment on in a lot of my film reviews. And the big one that everyone's talking about now is injecting social messaging into things. And I first want to talk about the reboots because I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier with video games. But a great example of this was when I reviewed the Cowboy Bebop live action reboot or whatever you call it. And in that review, I criticized a specific scene. The whole thing is bad. But there was one specific scene I criticized where they went and they held up a casino. And I talked about why thematically this made no sense. Why would you hold up a casino? That's like the last place on earth you would go to hold up for money considering they're run by well-armed crime syndicates. You know, that's like breaking into a police station or something to rob. You'd go somewhere that was a lot more vulnerable to rob, right? So I, I mentioned that in the review. And... A response to that from a person was, well, you're stupid because in the Cowboy Bebop movie, they go ahead and it's the same scene, but it's in a grocery store. So you see, this scene is valid because it was paying homage to the Cowboy Bebop film where they held up a grocery store. And I was trying to explain, no, that actually supports my criticism because you're lifting this scene from the Cowboy Bebop film but you're not understanding the underlying elements of what makes the scene work. You're taking a grocery store robbery, which makes sense in the context of that world, and placing it in a casino, which makes no sense in the context of the world. And just because you're paying homage to the original source material does not make it valid. And that's something that we'll see a lot with all this comic book crap, where whenever you try and criticize something in a comic book film, or criticize something that's adapting something else or rebooting something else, which is constantly what's happening. Everyone will always have that defense of, well, it's in the original source material. Oh, it's part of the original source material. And I'm trying to explain over and over, if it's not valid within the context that is being rebooted, it isn't valid, even if it is direct copy and paste from the source material. And so you could take a character from the original comic book or whatever and then make this whole new story and stick them in there but if it's not fitting with the context of the rest of the story that doesn't work and also kind of a dirty little thought is what if the original source material is flawed i don't think a lot of people even think about that these days when it comes to critiques where you say this is a bad story beat or this is an issue with the story and someone says well that's the original novel or original source material what if that's just an issue with the original source material that's reappearing? And that's what I'm saying. As long as you serialize your mistake, as long as it's a bad idea twice, it's good. So it's like the first time that's an issue. But if you keep doing it, then all of a sudden it's a good idea. You'll see that across comic book films and all that sort of stuff. I think in my Batman review, no one watched it. You know, it wasn't popular. But still in that Batman review, I sort of bring this up. The context of what the characters are doing doesn't really make sense in line with the story, especially with the Riddler. Anyway, so that one I wanted to get out of the way because that one's a little bit more simple. But the one that's a little bit more complicated and I think a little bit harder to explain, and I hope you have an open mind when I explain this, is 
this whole social messaging thing that's going on with films. That's a big hot topic right now, and I don't want to get into the whole hot topic of it. I'm trying to explain the process of it. And a great example of this that came up a few years ago was before I was more online aware, before I was more active on social media. And I'm not active on social media anymore, so this has kind of gone away finally. But before I was active on social media, I wasn't really plugged in with people's sensibilities of what social issues and all that sort of stuff. So in 2016, when that、uh, Ghost in the Shell reboot came out, I was commenting on the film because I went and saw it, and I just commented it on Discord. Thank God, not Twitter. This is a Discord conversation. But I was commenting on it on Discord and just talking about the issues with the film and how. Oh, this this part. It's not a good film. It's not a good film. But the main topic of that conversation then became the whole issue of Scarlett Johansson being cast instead of a Japanese lady. And I, my first reaction to that bit of conversation was, well, the the major is a robot. You know, the major is literally a, a robot body. And in fact, the major has different bodies throughout the series, right? Uh, the major doesn't have to be, you know, the typical major from the anime. She could be anyone. She could be anything because she's literally a robot.、And、so that was my point. But then we got into this whole conversation about social issues and blah 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 blah. The point of this is not to talk about the social issues of it all, but to say the way you look at these things can be through an artistic lens or through sort of an activist. Lens, and these are actually two distinct lens from one another, and I think that's getting more and more lost, especially with film criticism. As someone who grew up in a religious, a heavily religious community, this is something I'm a bit more actually aware of, because in the past, everything that came out had two sort of verdicts of it. When you talk to people about it, it's like, well, what is the religious implication of this film, and then what is the you know artistic. Implication of the film, and this was for everything, right? So you'd go over to your friends, and you wanted to watch Dragon Ball Z. Well, what is the religious implication of Dragon Ball Z? If you didn't really grow up in that environment, that's absurd. But there's people who view every single film, every single piece of media, through that lens of what does it mean in terms of religion, and they can't really separate that out from what does it mean aesthetically,、uh, artistically, right? What I want to do is I want to discuss the artistic merits of things. I don't want to get into your activist social issues. I have no interest in that. I find it frankly very boring. Even if I agreed, I'd find it incredibly boring. I want to discuss the artistic implications of the films that I review or the things that I watch with people. But people are so tied into that these days that it's very hard. For people to separate those from one another, to separate out the artistic issues of this film from the whatever social activist issues that they latch onto, right? And so that's a problem that I think we see over and over these days. I think has really impacted the quality of the filmmaking we see. There's committees now who who live and die by judging stuff by their social messaging points. And those people, I think, have begun to outnumber the artistically based critics. So now, whenever something comes out, that's all people talk about, and you can't get to the artistic qualities anymore. And I think they've really suffered for that reason. And it's made films not even fun to discuss, right? So you can't, for example, Ghost in the Shell 2016. Can I discuss that film? Not really, right? And it's unfortunate because I've had a lot to say about that film over the years, as far as its story and all that sort of thing. But it's very difficult to bring that up now because everything is so hot button and divisive, and it's just not fun anymore. But that's not the only issue. There's actually a lot more that are buried underneath it. But that's the one that always comes up. So I wanted to address that first. Another one that I really talked about quite a bit in my Batman review is thematic laundering. The idea of like Super Mario Bros. So let's make a thousand Batman films, and let's take Batman and just put all these different films that would have been distinct unto themselves in the Batman framework, whether or not it makes sense. So the Joker. A lot of people really liked the Joker. I thought it was a fun movie, 
But when you take a step back and you compare it to Taxi Driver, you compare it to those 70s films that really influenced it, is the film better for being a story about the Joker from Batman? Does that make the film better? Because a lot of the film's themes and elements feel more like they're held down by that Batman tie, by that Batman association. The character can't quite be fully fleshed out and fully realized because he's so tied into the Batman framework. His future is sort of locked away. So imagine if the Joker was a different IP. That could have been the starting of something very interesting, fresh, and new. But instead, it's part of the Batman series. And so the end of the film just washes into the general Batman storyline, right? It's like a river that just leads into a massive saltwater ocean in the end. So is it really worth the journey along the way? Because you're not sitting there thinking, well, what happens after this? What happens at the end of the film? Whereas at the end of Taxi Driver, where he's looking in the rearview mirror and you're thinking, what the hell is going to happen next? What's the story here? And after Taxi Driver ends, you sit there and you really think. And you really kind of write down and you go back through the movie and you sort of analyze the different elements of the film. What could this mean? What could that mean? What could the implications mean? The doors are open. There's so much more to dig through. But with the Joker, you know, there's no question. You know, he becomes a supervillain and starts, you know, blowing stuff up and being crazy. We know that's how it ends. You know, it's the ending is written into the franchise. And this is something that I really dislike with all these comic book movies. Same thing with the Batman. Yeah, it was a fun time. I liked the film. I'd like the sort of darker, grittier Batman movies that they're making definitely over the Marvel crap that they're turning out. But at the same time, they're all sort of handicapped by this superhero franchise that's been done over and over and over again. And they're all bleeding together and there's nothing distinctive or necessarily all that interesting and so you just watch the film you're like good film you kind of move on and maybe you can make a few little video essays about it but it's not something that's five years from now you're sitting thinking about the batman it's just not happening whereas 20 years later 15 years later whatever it is you're still sitting and thinking about silence of the lambs you're still thinking about seven those films have a distinctive identity that endures that isn't so watered down and jumbled and so this whole laundering of different stories into franchises, sure, people like to do it now because it gets people to go. But I think it's going to be diminishing returns. I think we're starting to see this with Star Wars where, oh, this is so smart. We're, we're going to launder all these different ideas into the Star Wars world and theme. And we're making all these different Star Wars films. And then people stop going after a bit. And I do wonder how long the comic books will can keep this up. It's pretty interesting that they're able to do it but i don't think it's going to continue on as long as people think it will as far as people going to see it there's a core of comic book fans who will probably go till the end of the days but as far as it being worthwhile in the end i'm not sure how long that's going to be able to continue but this whole thematic laundering franchise laundering i don't think it's going to be able to go on forever because even if you inject new stories and new films into these franchises it still all washes together in the end and then another example i want to discuss when it comes to film is when you're losing contact with the core material the core themes you're sort of building on top of building on top of building to the point where you've lost sight of the foundation and it doesn't make sense anymore an example of that that i saw is the new west side story and no one saw that because Steven Spielberg is really stupid on how he marketed that film, and I don't think it's a very good film. But there was a lot of issues with that film that I thought were particularly interesting to discuss, again, in this laundering example. So I'm not a big musical fan. I don't particularly like West Side Story, but West Side Story is based on my favorite play of all time, Romeo and Juliet, which I think is a fantastic work that endures centuries. So the thing about it is, Romeo and Juliet has a core theme, a core identity, and then West Side Story is kind of this 70s remake of Romeo and Juliet with its own little additions, right? The problem is, is when Steven Spielberg goes ahead and he makes his 2021 version of West Side Story, 
he's actually not looking back far enough into the underlying thematic material, which is Romeo and Juliet. So the stuff he adds into the 2021 version actually are very detrimental to the themes and the ideas of the original story to make it into some kind of Frankenstein monster that doesn't make sense. The big one is his idea of let's have the Jets and the Sharks speak different languages. So now the Jets speak, you know, English, the Sharks speak Spanish. He's doing that because he's looking at it from the perspective of West Side Story in the 1960s. And he's thinking, well, to build on that, this whole idea of doing the Jets and the Sharks and making them Puerto Rican and Irish and Italian or whatever they were. In the 60s, I think the idea was we just need to have two groups of teenagers that have a reason to fight each other. And let's just go with this, right? But in 2021, this whole different neighborhoods and different nationalities thing, this is like a bigger hot button issue, right? So his idea, let's build on that. Let's add elements to that. But the problem is, is that that core idea does not match up with Romeo and Juliet at all. Romeo and Juliet, the original story, they're all just Italians in a turf war. They all speak the same language. There's no national divide between them two. They're just these two young gangs of teenagers and families fighting each other for turf. So that's the core story. So the problem is, is that when you get that far away from the core story and then you're adding in, now they're speaking different languages from one another, that makes the love story not make sense anymore and like it makes it way more awkward and it makes it a whole different thing but you're still following along the plot points of Romeo and Juliet even though the all the additions you added of now it's about gentrification and it's about the clash of nationalities and how Romeo and Juliet don't understand each other and they're from these two different worlds it's like that's not Romeo and Juliet that's not the story that's not how it works it was a tragic turf war. It wasn't this people from different cultures thing. So you'll just see this come up over and over again in film where they're losing the core ideas and said they're just throwing in all these new elements and all these new themes and it's all just this jumbled ugly mess. And so that is 2021 West Side Story. It's just this massive ugly mess of all these different ideas that don't make sense that don't line up with each other and you walk away from it thinking what the hell did I just watch what am I even supposed to think about this what were they trying to tell me whereas you watch Dirty Harry I watched uh, Taxi Driver watch all these older films that's all baked into the idea of the film they choose the setting based on the themes and the ideas it's not they begin with the setting and then they throw in the IP and then they take this unrelated idea and just mash them together, which I think we're seeing over and over again to diminishing result. So that is the idea. I hope you all enjoy the video. Adios, everyone. Hello, everyone. This is Editor Mark here. I was so exhausted from the marathon recording session of this video. I recorded this the same night as the commentary video I did last that I forgot to say thank you for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, share with all your friends. I know this video is a little unconventional being an uncut. But I do enjoy doing these and I hope you all stay tuned for more content like this in the future, not just from up reviews all day, every day. <laughs> I think branching out every now and again is healthy, at least for my mind. And do check out my film reviews coming up. I think the next film review I'm going to be doing is of a really cool Australian Western film that very few people have seen called The Proposition. So. I want to introduce cool films to all, not just talk about the latest superhero movies or whatever. Adios, everyone. So thank you to the $5 patrons, 100, 100, Dingo, Another Joe, Anthony A, Anthony Iodice, Aaron Solis, Asa Davis, Ben, Borgie 22, Brian Shiver, Chris Yusufovich, Chronic Burnout 3, Cook Some Soup, Corey Mark, Des Audio, Darkwing, Darren Griffin, Delta Tango 6, Disco Star Slayer, DJ420, Praise It, Eric H, FCK Full Set, Retro Shmupper, Haosu, Kiwi, JLab, JBRPG, Jim Knockham, Joe Angelo, John Kelly, Jolts, Game Boy Guru, K, K2, Kikoman589, Larage, Malays, Mark Toms, Maz, Megadeth859, Minung, Mechelin, Michael Stern, Mitch LY, Nathaniel 
Miles Davis and Electron, Neon Dagger Games, Oakley Googles, Philip Mason, Plasma, Portal 63, Radocat, Raul, Real Skeen, Riff Mason, Rolf, Scanline City, Seven Overdose, Shane Sintansky, Schmup Junkie, The Boot Rex, The Real Ikuzo, The Dirty Screech, The N1, The Old Benster, TRM, Sugumo, Twilight, and Utakaya. Thanks for watching.